guys with us. Hello, hello, hello. Um, hello, Lars. Do you hear hello. us? Yeah, I can hear. Hi. Yeah, it's great. Hello, Matti. Also. Hello, Lars. Hello, going? hello. Thanks, fine. Uh, this this started raining here, just so a little bit wet. I came from the Otaniemi. Same here. Okay, yeah, it's heavy rain. Perfect time staying inside. Yeah, yeah. Nice picture here. <laughs> That's where I'm mentally okay. right now. Yeah. Um, шановні друзі, я так бачу, що вже майже всі до нас приєдналися, хто збирався, 23 людини у нас в чаті. Хочу вам представити сьогоднішнього лектора, це Матті, він буде вести свою лекцію англійською мовою, відповідно, це наш фінський партнер. Hello, Matti. Hello. Hello, Lars. It's very pleasant for us to see you this hot day with us. Um, I know that Matti uh, has a Master of Science in Engineering, and uh, the main specialty is, is product design and innovation. And today we, uh, we are in the lecture, Art of Co-Creation, and Mati has a book, uh, the same title, uh, Art of Co-Creation. I know that Mati worked for Alto University for many years. It's in, uh, not far from Helsinki, it's Espo City. And also Mati has experience in working uh, in China, um, Shanghai, is it right? Yeah? Yes, Shanghai for four years and Hong Kong for one year. Hong Kong one, yeah. Oh, that's great. And I think that uh, all the participants can ask their questions during the uh, webinar in the chat, and then you will uh, put them aloud in the, in the end of our lecture, okay? So, Mati, the stage is for you. Please, go on. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, it's afterwards, or then someone can read them out loud during the presentation. So I'll switch to the presentation mode now and see if this works. Uh, I will not be able to see you guys during this presentation. So please uh, interrupt if there's something fishy going on. Uh, so I currently work for Forum Virum Helsinki, which is the innovation company for the city of Helsinki. You can see my Twitter tag there. So Matti Hammers, if if you'd like to tag something on, on Twitter, feel free to do that. And uh, uh, if I say a few words about Forum Virium, uh, Forum Virium is how I'd like to describe them as the James Bond of city of Helsinki. So we get to do all kind of uh, special stuff. We have a license to act in a different way from, from all the other units. And then there's usually somebody else who cleans up the mess that we make. We also have to take responsibility in, in all of our experiments. And a lot of what we do is about uh, co-creation. So we do work uh, in collaboration with average citizens, with public organizations and with private organizations. And uh, uh, the secret to being successful in developing cities uh, in developing new practices is in bringing different type of persons with different interests together. And uh, that brings us to the topic of, of this session. So the art of co-creation. Uh, the brief agenda for today is here. So, so I'll go through four different points. Uh, first one being description of what we call the co-creation journey. It's a journey starting from somewhere and uh, like in a, in a narrative, uh, in a story uh, during a journey, the team evolves. So they go through different hardships and they eventually, uh, hopefully uh, in the end, they become successful. So uh, an illustration of, of this journey, you can see in the background. Uh, then I will address the issue of diversity in teams. So what reason and what kind of function there are for diversities in team. Uh, then I will tell you a couple of examples how to deal with this diversity so that it's as beneficial 
for the co-creation team as possible. And finally, I will give a very kind of engineering simplified description of uh, what the art of co-creation is in practice. To start with, uh, this is uh, the illustration for, for the journey of co-creation. So starting from the left, uh, when a new team sets on a mission of co-creation, they want to design or innovate something, uh, they start from, from the interface or from the surface between known and the unknown. So first they start exploring what is known. They share uh, with each other what they know about different fields. Uh, the engineers tell about so their uh, field of expertise to the sociologists, to the psychologists, to the designers, uh, until the team has reached the peak of the known. So the point where, where they have to start digging deeper into some, something uh, that is the unexplored territory or the unknown. At that point, they will, the journey turns into a dive. So they will go down into the unknown and that will radically change the whole dynamic of, of this journey. Uh, there is the element of uncertainty that will create a lot of tension within the team. And it requires the team to really pull closely together, start performing really well together in order for them to turn the curve upwards again. And after they have discovered something new at the unknown, uh, and after they have come together as a team, so after their performance as a team is good enough, they will start climbing again, creating something new in the end, uh, reaching a level that was not possible before. So in brief, this is the co-creation journey. Uh, you can see at the bottom uh, that we have called these three stages of these uh, journeys, the, the known uh, or the climb. Uh, then the second stage is the unknown, which I've, I also call the, the dive, and then the new or the rise. So where, where there's something novel coming out as a result of this co-creative team effort. So breaking down a bit, uh, this two uh, fold issue, uh, I'll now briefly describe what I mean by diversity. So diversity in a team uh, relates to basic human behavior, basic psychology, where uh, if somebody is asked to pick a team for themselves, whether this happens in a school or uh, in your company, what we human beings uh, naturally, uh, intuitively do is that we pick a friend, somebody who's very much alike of us, who is a colleague who we are very similar with to be our first teammates. And then maybe the second teammate would be someone who's, who's again quite similar, has a similar background, about the same age, maybe the same sex. And this is how we behave if we are instructed to just form a team. Now, this type of a team where the team members are very similar with each other uh, is called a homogeneous team, meaning that there's uh, a lot of overlapping in the history or experience in the discipline of knowledge and understanding between the team members. So each additional team member does not bring a lot that's new to the team. Whereas if we think about a team that would be diverse, uh, the basic nature is very different from the homogeneous team. So in a diverse team, every single team member adds a new area of diversity. So they bring in a lot of new expertise to the team. Uh, mean whatever the scales are, this means that the team collectively will cover a much wider range of expertise compared to homogeneous teams or uh, even the smartest individuals. And I think this illustration uh, pretty well uh, 
conveys the message why diversity is important within teamwork. And, and again, uh, this is the kind of first element of building a very creative team is that you need to explore the limits of diversity. Uh, when you are planning for a new team or a new innovation journey, uh, the first thing that you should consider is what type of talents, what type of expertise do I need in all order to solve a problem or develop a new product or a new service. Uh, once you start mapping that uh, and understanding that, again, once you start bringing people who are very different from each other together, uh, there is a natural course uh, that will happen, which is that uh, these people might not get along very well. So that is something that we have to deal with later on. Uh, we also have to understand that when we were designing or building this team, uh, there needs to be connections between these team members. So if there's a gap between the uh, expertise fields uh, of different individuals, uh, that means that there is no connection point. So, for example, the yellow person on the right, if they don't share uh, a common vocabulary, for example, with the red person, and they need somebody to ask, act as interpreter or as a bridge person between them in order for them to collaborate. So the purple person also has, has a kind of a uh, very critical interpersonal role in bridging uh, the knowledge or the background or the personalities between these two individuals uh, in the same way as uh, that person would act between other individuals as well. So uh, again, understanding when we're designing teams that we need to consider both the fields of expertise uh, and also uh, the different types of personalities that these uh, experts would have. So as an example, uh, a very introvert, uh, hardcore uh, electrical engineer might not get, a, get along very well uh, with a very extrovert sociologist or a psychologist. And, and if both of their uh, expertise are needed to perform really well, uh, then a team leader or team manager has to figure out how they can be either taught to work together, so to get along in such a way that the team uh, performance is not compromised, or if the, the team uh, activities can be somehow split up in such a way that the, their performance can be complementing each other without them having to uh, conflict uh, with each other's personalities during the teamwork. Then uh, I'll continue to a uh, more practical thing related to, to handling this diversity. So uh, traditionally in kind of conventional organizational psychology, uh, if there is any kind of friction or tension, or if there are conflicts within any organization, the natural course of action would be to somehow release or reduce this tension. So for example, uh, if, if there are conflicts, continuous conflicts within a team, within a company, uh, in many cases, an external consultant is invited or brought in to resolve these conflicts. And as a result, the team is expected to become harmonious. So people will like to work each other. Their stress levels will be reduced. And again, uh, there is an assumption that when the conflicts disappear, then the team will perform better than if there are conflicts. And naturally, it was not good uh, to have a team or an organization that has continuous unsolved problems. So if there are conflicts, uh, the conflicts need to be addressed and dealt with. Uh, they should be perhaps analyzed 
uh, figure out if they are interpersonal ones. So if uh, the roots uh, of these problems come from different types of personalities or personal political perspectives uh, or different ways of uh, talking, behaving, uh, different uh, levels of experience or something like that. And figuring out how to uh, handle these conflicts is again very, very uh, important in order to create a high performing team. But I would really like to challenge this assumption that uh, the resolution for, for tension is only to reduce this tension or somehow to release it so that the team will become harmonious. So, so in order for a team to be creative, they do not necessarily have to be happy with each other at all times. They don't have to be uh, even liking each other all the time. Uh, in my experience, uh, there are a lot of high-performing design teams that have continuous uh, friction or continuous conflicts between team members. And because they are professionals, they are able uh, to deal with these conflicts. They don't take it personally when they are expected to perform as a team. It might mean that these people would not go out for beer together uh, if they are not forced to but they will be able to perform together. And uh, many managers who are assigned to uh, build these design teams or innovation teams, they look for this type of tension. If they see that the, the people in the team are working together uh, around the table and everyone's laughing and smiling and that nobody's frustrated they see this, this level of harmony as a sign uh, of underperforming. And as uh, uh, Kathleen Eisenhardt, to my opinion, famously once stated, uh, the absence of conflict should not be considered to be harmony. Uh, it should be considered to be apathy. And if, if you reduce the conflicts too much, that also takes away all the tension and all of the energy within the team. So in this sense, it would not be good if all of the team members are feeling only good at all the times. So again, understanding uh, that, of course, there needs to be a balance between having conflicts and tension versus uh, enjoying your work and enjoying your team but it's not uh, always good to be pushing towards one edge or the other one. So not to escalate the conflicts too much, but not to reduce them or to really get rid of all of the conflicts uh, too much uh, if you want to have a performing team. And again, coming back to this journey, uh, if you start breaking apart this co-creation journey uh, that the team performs together into uh, separate uh, dimensions, uh, or as I've labeled them, three separate journeys, we, we can start understanding uh, in a little bit better way how this uh, different kind of dynamics and different kind of tensions occur during this trip. So as you might remember, the green part was the, the first uh, leg of the journey or the, the climb. The red part was the dive where the uh, a curve starts going down again. And, and uh, the blue part is the rise. And if we think about uh, this kind of innovation or co-creation journey in the terms of knowledge or knowledge creation, uh, I would say that the ultimate goal of this uh, journey is to increase the level of knowledge. So increase the understanding related to a specific topic. 
this is something that I would very much like to discuss with uh, with you guys. Uh, so if you if you have a different opinion about the objective of of uh, innovation journey or innovation project, please I would like to uh, to be challenging this part. But if I see the knowledge as the ultimate objective, so you want to understand the problem and understand the possible solutions and understand what is impossible, and then the journey curve looks pretty much like this. You start as a team at the bottom, at kind of zero or basic level of knowledge, and during the trip, you do some experiments, you uh, get knowledge through uh, surveys, talking to people by building something through dialogue, and at the end, you have reached a level which is high enough to solve the problem. What can be considered to be the driver for this knowledge increase uh, is the second journey or the second curve, uh, which we have labeled as the team dynamics or team performance. And why this uh, team dynamics uh, should be considered to be the driver for, for the knowledge is uh, because if the team is not performing well, they will not be able to generate new knowledge. So for that reason, uh, in this kind of general setting, if we look at the, what happens during this uh, co-creation journey, is that in the beginning, team members will have to become aware of what uh, other team members know. So they will have to learn the history, the background, the skills of their team members. And at that point, they will start becoming a team. Once they learn what the others do, how they behave, they can start rehearsing their uh, team working skills. And at some point, when they have reached a level that's high enough, so they start uh, developing these collective capacities or team working skills, then they will also be able to start developing new knowledge. Part of that new knowledge can be developed within that team already. So again, uh, they, the team members can consult each other in such a way that the team members will bring in new ideas and uh, together they can elevate the level of knowledge. And uh, some uh, some aspects will have to be gathered together. So for example, this, this team can build experiments together. They can uh, do interviews uh, or start building new prototypes, new models, uh, whatever is required for them to understand, again, the issue that they are addressing better uh, and, in, and uh, to create something that's novel. But fundamentally, uh, the knowledge does not increase if the team is not performing well. So they have to reach first the level uh, where they can work together. Otherwise, they will be just a bunch of individuals and the white curve or the knowledge curve will remain flat. Uh, then again, if we think about reality, uh, the journey does not always look like this. So in many cases, uh, there will be a high level of friction between individual team members, which means that the team might have to be pushed to produce something already early on within the process, even though the team members are not getting along really well. And again, this type of dynamic within, within the interpersonal relationships uh, in a team, this might really slow down the process. Uh, so the knowledge would not, in reality, uh, develop as fast. Uh, and at the same time, once the team will be able to uh, develop new knowledge, so they have reached a certain level of, of new knowledge, regardless of the conflicts, that will also improve uh, the interpersonal relationships and possibly uh, 
increase the performance of the team. So there might be a quick boost within that te team because they have understood uh, that they can perform together and they don't like to have they don't have to like each other in order for them to reach uh, goals together. And again, that will be boosting the knowledge development to the level where where the team will be eventually able to reach their goals. And again, because these are really nice, uh, well-aligned illustrations, uh, anyone who has been working in a diverse team would know that the development of the team is quite often not very subtle. So they might be stages where the team begins to work really well. And in the beginning, when there are when the team doesn't have very uh, big challenges, they just need to be developing their capacity together. Things will be going very, very well. So again, uh, everybody is feeling happy. They like each other's company. They appreciate each other until they find a point where they would have to be pushing harder. And at that point, the performance might start slowing or more quickly going down. And again, this, uh, this is what the current leaders or managers of innovation teams should be able to deal with. So this, this is the uh, externally sudden uh, but quite predictable uh, change in, in the performance of the team. So at the top point where the team is performing really well, there might be just a small incidence that will completely destroy the trust, for example, between the team members, which means that their performance will go down. And a good manager, a good leader will have to deal with this in such a way that the curve will start going upwards again so that the team can reach the expected level of, of performance. Okay, and coming back to the original kind of theoretical uh, model of team behavior, uh, we can then add a third curve, which is uh, not really part of today's uh, management literature in this way. So if we add the third journey or third curve, uh, which is the emotional journey, uh, then we have reached a very uh, high complexity level in the performance and in, in the different types of uh, tensions of, of this innovation team. So if you look at how the red curve, the emotions and the team dynamics perform with each other, uh, the red curve often is truly the leader or the driver for any changes in the team dynamics. So in a kind of optimal theoretical case, this is how a co-creation journey would look like. So in the beginning, the emotions will be very positive and they will be developing to be even more positive while the challenge level is not very high. So when the emotions are, are positive, team members are feeling happy with each other. They trust each other. Uh, the team dynamics of the blue line will also gradually start uh, increasing. And as a result, also the level of knowledge will slowly start increasing. And this holds true only to the critical point of turn when the challenge becomes a bit higher than uh, the team can face with the existing knowledge. So when they have reached the point where, where no existing solutions can solve their problem, this is usually when this team's emotions start turning into negative. And again, from management perspective, this is a very critical point because this is where 
the leaders should react in such a way and that the performance of the team will not go down even if the emotions will turn into negative ones. And again, if we think about uh, physical training as an analogy in this context, uh, if an athlete trains hard, after the training, their body will go to a state where they are not able to perform very well. So they will re require rest. And only after resting their body, uh, they will be able to take their performance to, to a higher level. In sports, this is called super compensation. Uh, and what every athlete knows that uh, the most important part of their training is the rest period. Because during rest, their bodies can recover from, uh, from the training and during the rest, the performance will increase. In a very similar way uh, with, uh, with this type of team activities, uh, once the team has reached uh, the highest level of their performance, they will have to somehow switch into this uh, recovery mode. So understanding that uh, during the negative emotions period, they will have to find ways uh, to recover as a team so that their, the blue curve remains uh, positive, it keeps going upwards. Uh, and at the same time, they will be producing some new knowledge so that the performance stays, that stays positive. Uh, in most cases, uh, this doesn't happen so smoothly because the emotions can turn from positive to negative very quickly, uh, especially with a new team where people do not trust each other very well. One sentence that is being said inappropriately or misinterpreted might create uh, some unresolvable conflicts, which will again bring the entire team down. And even if there is a, an attempt to correct these emotions, so to improve them, there might be a second drastic fall that will be following that one. So again, uh, this does not necessarily uh, surface as a, as a poor performance yet, but it will precede most definitely uh, weakening of the team dynamics. So the team will not be able to perform very well uh, if there are too many negative emotions between uh, the team members. Uh, and at the same time, if you look at the point where the blue curve starts going upwards again, uh, the team emotional state might be still pretty low. So again, good manager would be able to find some way for the team to, to be uh, performing really well. So pulling themselves together again and uh, handling these negative emotions. Uh, and this might just require uh, for the team to uh, build new type of trust to each other, understanding that they are on a sh shared mission, that they are not fighting against each other, but rather they, they are trying to achieve something together uh, so that they will uh, not be fighting against each other, not wasting their energy uh, to battling with the team members, but they will be somehow able to join their forces in, in order to proceed towards a common goal. Uh, well, again, talking with this uh, abstract illustration, uh, I hope this makes sense so you can make connections to, to your own experience and uh, think about some points uh, where you have experienced these type of shifts in either emotional status within the team or in the performance status. And maybe 
figuring out if you have been part of a team where there has been a lot of tension and still unresolved conflicts, for example, between different team members, but the team has been able to in improve their performance. So regardless of negative emotions, the team has pulled themselves together and started working again as a team. In my experience, uh, the key to achieving this is strengthening or building trust between different team members. So as long as there is trust and as long as there is enough communication in different formats between different team members, then it is possible for the team to perform really well, even if there are negative attentions. And uh, at the same time, this negative attention should be dealt with, but they should not be driving the performance of the team again. Uh, coming back to this from a little bit different angle, uh, if we think about a new team, especially if it's a diverse team, uh, the communication between different team members in the beginning of, of a new a design project might look like this. So, so the team members, especially if they are excited about the project, if they are passionate and if they want to perform well, they will be communicating with each other, uh, but the communication will be directed towards different team members, which means that the more diversity there is within a team and the more people there are within the team, uh, at the same time, the more time each individual will have to spend to convince everyone else that their ideas are good. So again, they will be using almost all of their energy into dealing with other team members uh, instead of building something together. So, so uh, for a good leader, uh, it should be quite easy to shift uh, the energy towards a goal, common goal. And if you have been performing uh, in a creative or design team that has gone through this, this kind of uh, uh, journey where there is clear shift in, in dynamics, uh, then you might be able to very specifically identify a point where the dynamics of the team has gone from the left side. So from uh, dealing with individuals and trying to raise your voice so that everybody else would hear you better and agree with you towards not talking against other people, but uh, towards a common goal. So. So this uh, alignment of efforts would be a state of performance where the efforts of each individual is uh, shifted from battling against each other towards improving the common uh, objective. And this might mean that, for example, there is a shared uh, prototype or a shared model that will be the focus of attention. And when this kind of shared objective has been achieved, that means that the people will not be debating against each other anymore, but they will be uh, discussing how to improve this. So shift should be uh, from interpersonal uh, disagreement or interpersonal dynamics to uh, external performance. So developing a common goal. And when a team reaches this kind of common objective or common goal, they will uh, very quickly uh, start building this, this common goal uh, instead of uh, just tackling each other. And the energy that was wasted in interpersonal conflicts can now be used for, for uh, advancing the common goal. And uh, once a team has performed long enough so that they start really 
trusting each other and feeling uh, that they are on a joint mission, at some point the team might start uh, really resonating, meaning that uh, the team members will be able to complete each other's sentences and they don't have to explain everything that they have in their minds because they will be able to utilize each other's expertise as kind of an extension to their body. So for example, uh, the engineer within the team can be uh, asking the designer of the team to make an illustration that they can use for their own performance. So they use the designer as an extension to their knowledge in order for them them to make, for example, an effective presentation that they can use for, for uh, advancing their project. So again, this, uh, this is the state where the team is performing really well and they are not uh, fighting for their own individual goals or, or time to uh, make sure that they're not making mistakes anymore. But they collectively will work as a team and within this kind of context, uh, often when, when the team comes up with a new idea, uh, it is very difficult to state afterwards who came up with the idea, because that was a collective effort. And again, it will take a very long time for the team to reach this level where they are really performing collectively. So they, they the, individuality of the team members will suddenly disappear and they will just consider themselves as us or the team rather than members of the team. Uh, and something that especially to an outsider might look very much same as the resonance. So collective performance uh, is a team that has a very strong leader and uh, within a team that has a strong leader, uh, the performance can be very high, even though uh, it's not collective performance anymore. And uh, it's good to understand the difference between these two formats of performing. And so when we're discussing about dominance, uh, this means that there's always one person who is the authority figure who makes all the decisions. And this person usually also gets the credit for everything that has been done. And uh, this type of very authoritarian or controlling uh, team performance uh, is very much cultural dependent. So in certain cultures, very strong hierarchical approach, even to teamwork is more common than in, in others. Uh, this does not mean that in very strongly authoritarian cultures uh, you could not have collectively performing teams. It often means that this type of working has to be done under the radar because it might interfere with the basic assumption of how work is done. And in a similar way, in a very collective societies where performance mostly would be uh, of uh, harmonious or collective in nature, sometimes you need a very strong, very authoritarian way of uh, performing. And in this case, you might want or you might need to hide that in, into, into something else. Uh, for you guys, what is worth understanding is the difference between how this works. So on the left side, uh, people are not working as a collective. They will be asked by the boss to do one part of a task and they might even have shared tasks so they will be working together with each other. But as they are not collect, uh, as they are, for example, being evaluated individually, so their performance is always compared against their teammates. This means that they will not be really working for each other, but they are working for the boss. And this makes a big difference uh, in how the team solves problems and how they handle challenges. 
So moving on to the kind of final point, uh, debunking or decoding the process of co-creation. Uh, this is a short list of how to build uh, high-performing, dynamic, and diverse team. Uh, as an engineer, this is easy step-by-step -step list of how to do it. In reality, it will be much more difficult, again, because you have to have, have uh, certain experience in, how, in knowing how to deal with, for example, interpersonal uh, conflicts, how to deal with emotions within, uh, within the journey, so during some stages and so on. But the first step for, for uh, starting a co-creation journey is defining the stakeholders, defining the fields of expertise that you need for your team, and based on that, building the team that would be uh, diverse enough to cover the main fields uh, that are required to be covered for your team so that you can, you can complete your mission. Once you have uh, hired, recruited team members, you should be identifying possible gaps between certain individuals. So, so understanding that they might be uh, a person that has specific uh, field of knowledge that is crucial for the team. So they need to re recruit that person to the team, but their personal uh, behavior or personal experience or personality might be so different from the rest of the team that they might be left as an outsider. So they might not be a good fit for the team. And if you identify these type of gaps, uh, then there are several ways how to deal with it. One would be that uh, you would recruit a person that would be a better fit for the team. So get rid of the yellow person and recruit somebody who is, is uh, closer to the team. So there's some kind of overlapping with the existing team members. Or then you uh, hire another person who will be bridging the gap between uh, the team members. Uh, once you have uh, fixed your team, then you should start uh, rehearsing and start developing this team. So have a first meeting, invite the people over, make sure that everyone gets to know each other. And then at certain point, uh, start shifting the efforts of this team from each other towards uh, your project goals. So figure out what type of skills the team needs so that they can uh, cross the gap. So, so get uh, over the dive as smoothly as possible so that they are strong enough to stay good together as a team so that the most likely upcoming interpersonal conflicts will not break the team apart, which means that you will be rehearsing certain type of team working skills. What they are, uh, that's up to you, as long as you understand the importance of, of uh, rehearsing uh, team working skills together. So again, these type of skills you cannot train individually. You have to have the entire team there. And with that team, you should be figuring out what kind of exercises you can do, uh, hopefully in a way that will be also uh, advancing your project goals. Uh, but the main objective of those exercises would be to improve the team performance skills, team working skills, so that when the emotions start turning into negative and when uh, there's possibility of major conflicts, which would be reducing the team performance, uh, at that time, the team will be remaining strong and they will be able to perform. So preparing the team for challenges. Uh, this might take a while. Uh, at the same time, 
you should be making sure that all of the team members are sharing what they have with each other. So sharing their knowledge with each other uh, so that everybody else knows how to utilize your field of expertise. Uh, once uh, the team has shared what they have, the team members should be exploring to produce some new knowledge. So, so again, combining what they have and they do, maybe doing some experiments in order to figure out Again, something that hasn't been tried before. And eventually, after these six steps of preparation, uh, the team should then finally use this collective capacity or collective intelligence in order to co-create. So, so at this point, uh, they should have high enough level of knowledge, high enough level of understanding, uh, and also they should have uh, good enough team performance skills that they will be able to behave collectively. Uh, they are a brain consisting of five or seven team members and with this collective brain they can solve the problems that have been set in front of them. Uh, and from co-creation dynamics perspective uh, this is kind of uh, the process for, for creating a high-performing team. So deliberately decide what type of skills you need within the team, rehearse the individual's work or perform as a team, set them on a mission so that they will acquire or produce new knowledge, and then, and only after these steps have been taken, they, then you can start using this, this team as a collective uh, problem-solving machine. And then after this uh, co-creation task has been performed, uh, you might, might uh, want to use the same uh, collectively working team to solve another problem at the same time. But what is important is also to record and document all of the results that the team comes up with, even the ones that might not be useful at this time, but they should be put down uh, in the same way as, as the uh, problems that they have discovered or, or the issues that they have dealt with in order for, for the team and for the organization to avoid going through the same problems again, and in order for them to be able to start building on some discoveries that the, the team has made. So uh, to wrap up, uh, kind of short description of what a co-creation journey requires and what a collective performance requires is that if we look at collective intelligence through two different axes or two different dimensions. So on the left side, there's the shared knowledge or level of knowledge. And on the bottom, there's the team dynamics or team performance. Uh, the team should develop their knowledge. So increase their understanding of the topic and they should do it as a team. So once they have reached a high enough level uh, collectively, so they don't all have to know everything, but collectively they have reached a level, uh, then they will need to require, uh, sorry, uh, increase their team performance uh, so that they, they can uh, utilize this collective knowledge. Uh, and uh, if a team has reached both these goals, so they have been able to increase their knowledge or created some new knowledge, and at the same time they have discovered ways of performing as a team, if all goes well, they have reached this sweet spot of collective intelligence. And uh, it might not 
last for a very long time. So this team might be able to maybe perform using this collective intelligence for only a few days or a few weeks. Uh, and then the team might be required to be broken apart and set on a different mission. But the performance at this point is uh, really groundbreaking. So if you have a team and with that team, you are able to reach this level of co collective intelligence, uh, that means that uh, you will be able to resolve problems that did not even exist. Uh, I would love to share some examples of, of how this has happened in, in uh, industry, uh, but that might take a bit too much time. So I decided not to include these concrete examples uh, for this set. I can discuss them later on uh, and I can share some, uh, some slides and examples of uh, collective performance from industry. Uh, with you guys, if you are interested. Uh, thank you for listening through. Uh, if you are interested in more details related to this co-creation journey, uh, please check our book, The Art of Co-creation, uh, from 2018. So it was published two years ago. And uh, now I'll open the floor to questions and comments. So Mati, thank you very much for the webinar. And uh, yes, we have questions. Uh, can you open the chat right now? Yes, I can open it. Because there are a lot of, yeah. Uh, the first comment was from Konstantin Romanov about the sea, that it, it is painful to watch the sea when you're staying at home. <laughs> I understand. Oh, yeah. Andrei Mahin Boroda, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you read your questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, I was asking about, uh, probably you may... Uh, tell us some tricks or some tools uh, on how to build up the trust between team members. Uh, I mean, sometimes you get some troubles in a team and the situation in a whole just pissing you off and everyone is just high on emotions and probably some tools to, to deal with it. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I hate it because it's really difficult to answer. Uh, so uh, building trust, uh, again, that's, that's the art. That's, uh, that's really hard to put into a textbook and explaining how you build trust. So again, uh, there are so many kind of nuances related to the team dynamics or interpersonal relationships. Uh, uh, that uh, there is no kind of predetermined process for doing that. I understand, but, again, but probably some samples will do. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the easiest way to explain something when you just put sample, samples on. Yeah. The sample examples uh, I personally dislike, but they are very effective. So again, if you have a new team, so the te team members have not uh, worked together, uh, you might want to take them completely out of the context of the work, depending, again, if you're in school. In school, you usually have new teams, or if you are, are working for a company or, or other organization. But take, take them out of this context. Usually, uh, what corporations do is they rent a log cabin somewhere or something like this, which is outside of the city, and they take the team there. And then within the team, they do these uh, trust exercises. And, and I know that, again, how these team exercises work out is very culturally sensitive. Uh, so, for example, stuff that would work out in Scandinavia would not work out necessarily in the US and vice versa. And same with, with Russia, for example, uh, even the concept of, of trust is built in a different way. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, what I would start doing is, is just having these uh, very simple 
uh, trust building exercises, which you can Google and find on YouTube, where there are two, uh, two persons or two team members standing like this behind you, and you fall back with your eyes closed, awesome. and you have to trust your team members to catch you. Yeah, I've seen it that the guy was falling off in the other way. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, th there are problems with this because, again, at the same time, you want to build trust, but you don't want, well, this is my opinion, but you don't want the team to become too trustworthy. So if, if everybody is too harmonious with each other, so if they trust each other too much, uh, and for example, if I would be catching that person, I might, if not, let, if I, well, I probably wouldn't let them go fall on the ground, but I might just do this so that they think that they are falling on the ground because I like keeping up tension. I, I like making bad jokes. And in a team where I would be one member, most likely there will be a lot of jokes and a lot of tension and there will be people who hate me. Yeah, same with me. Yeah. And again, that's, that's where it becomes tricky. So but just that doing trust exercises like that will uh, prepare the team to be, again, uh, reducing the conflicts uh, so that they will be liking each other, they will be trusting. Uh, because it seems uh, too childish. Yes, thank for you for saying people. that. Yeah? Because yeah. that can be a barrier that you cannot uh, overwhelm when you think it's too childish, I, wanna take I don't want to take part in it and just, well, it, it won't work. Yeah, that's a good point, and that's why I don't like them. Uh, then again, for this, uh, there's a good reason for doing it outside the city in a log cabin, because that also will definitely improve the team dynamics or interpersonal relationships. Because if you are the leader of this team and you, you say that, okay, we will do it here because there's no one to see it, and everybody has to swear, pinky swear or what, whatever you want to do. Everybody has to swear that you will not tell anyone outside of this team about what has happened here. This will again increase the level of trust. You have to trust each other that you don't share about stuff that happened there. And then a leader, well, a smart leader would prepare this beforehand so that this leader would train two people to be really catching them when they fall, but a leader would perform first, show how this is done, and kind of losing their face at the same time, saying that, okay, this is ridiculous stuff, and I don't want to do it, but it's important, and that's why even I will do it. And how to create also this, this kind of atmosphere where people can... Uh, take each other as persons rather than uh, as the boss, as, as a colleague, that's also something that's important. Uh, this is something that I've uh, personally, not so uh, intentionally, but I've done. So for example, as you can maybe see, I, I like wearing Hawaiian shirts and I have a really funny beard. Yeah, that's, that's good beard, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, it works out for me because if I would look like a regular mechanical engineer wearing a, a striped shirt and a, and a club jacket, people would respond to me in a completely different way compared to me doing this. And I mean, I have pinstripe suits in the, in the closet. I do wear those occasionally, but I know that this appearance will have a different impact. Being so for stripes suit. Pinstripe. Oh, yes. oh okay. Yeah, okay. so Can the, you show it? No, I'd have to take <laughs> no, 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 I'm it. joking. I'm joking. Sorry. But I, I do have it. I don't wear it in public. I would lose my reputation. Yeah. But again, uh, kind of making, making sure that, for example, if you go, if you are the leader of the team, uh, you go out there and you normally wear your jacket. Then you kind of ritualistically take off the jacket and make everyone aware of that and say that, okay, now for this 
weekend or now for these two days, I will not be wearing my tie and my jacket. So I'm out of my boss role. And then after those childish exercises have been completed, then you put on your tie and your jacket again, and then you are the boss again. So this is something that will work out. And again, that's pushing you above a limit. Uh, well, for me, it's much easier now because I've crossed so many limits personally already. But again, that will create also trust towards you. So you, you are willing to go outside of your comfort zone, make yourself look ridiculous. Okay. And then you have to, again, pink and swear or, I don't know, make a blood oath or something like that to make sure that what happens inside the cabin stays inside the cabin. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and personally, yeah, I, I hate those type of exercises, but sometimes that's really something that you must do uh, and it doesn't have to take place in the beginning so i might wait for a few months so that the people get to know each other already before they go there and uh, being from up north what really eases up in the in the process of building trust is in finland that would be beer in russia i believe that would be vodka but uh, it's ukraine yeah it's ukraine it's gonna be beer as well i guess okay any any form of alcohol because again that gives you an excuse so when you have opened up the first can uh that kind of gives you permission to behave in a different way and then you just need to make sure that people don't drink while they're doing their jobs <laughs> yeah. but it's just yeah it's kind of funny you when you take a can and then you can immediately start behaving drunk even when you're not so you can start saying insults, at least in, in the Finnish cultural context. And that's a very powerful tool. Well, this is Coke. Uh, but uh, that's a very powerful tool that should be utilized. In, uh, in Asian culture, that's even more systematic. I don't know if you are uh, aware of the, for example, Japanese karaoke culture, where... Well, uh, Japanese... slightly, by, by, by the movies. Yeah. Okay. But the boss is really strong. You, you do not say anything. You do, never, never object to the boss. You can not give any kind of feedback to the boss to the point where the boss doesn't get any feedback even when they need it. So, so for this reason, in that context, they have these karaoke nights where you drink and it's okay for you to tell your boss what an asshole they are. And that's really important because that's the only way they can get negative feedback. Yeah. You, you can punch your boss in the face and it's okay because it happened to Ricardo okay night. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Anything else? Great, great, great tradition. Uh, oh, well. Punching yeah. your boss in the face, you mean? Yeah. I, I like this idea, actually. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, we have some more questions. Uh, and here is Daria Gnab. Daria, are you with us? Ooh, that's a bad one. Dasha? She wrote a question, but I'm not sure she is yeah. with us at the moment. Well, I, I can read that maybe What do loud. you think about the trend or a trend having happiness managers at some officers? Mm, do they help to co-create? How do you think, Mati? Yeah. So that's, that's a good, more analytical question. So again, uh, kind of personally, not professionally, personally, I'm against these happiness managers or this happiness trend to an extent. Like, like I was describing, uh, if you only try to make, achieve harmony within an organization, then yeah, sure, everybody will be happy, but they will not be really performing well. So in that sense, if you only have these happiness managers or if your objective is to have, have a team that always just keeps smiling, uh, I think you are, yeah, you're, you're not really on a proper track. If you have a happiness manager uh, 
and a conflict manager or something like that, then that might work. So, so I'm in that sense, I'm not against having a person who, who uh, looks for interpersonal conflicts, for example, and tries to resolve them, as long as they understand that your workplace doesn't have to be an amusement park. Everybody doesn't have to enjoy everything. And actually, uh, again, according to my experience, uh, you have to be, you know, at the point of where you're really frustrated in order to be pushing yourself beyond the limit. And only after going through that negative period, you can really enjoy yourself. So again, the red curve, the emotion curve would not go down if there would be continuous happiness taking place inside an organization. Yeah, maybe it uh, depends on the type of business uh, yeah. you have also. When but, you have the beach bar, it's uh, one thing. And when you have strong business for corporations, it's something else, another. Yeah, that's true. Uh, something that I kind of like as, an, as, a, as a team dynamics thing is, uh, is, a, is a candy person. Uh, so excursions, student excursions, uh, at least on other university, they very often they have a, a candid person who's assigned, and that person is in charge of having a kind of, can of candy uh, available at all times. And the need for that is is that that person is always looking at okay, is somebody having a bad day? And if somebody is having a bad day, instead of trying to you know uh, preach happiness they go and offer them candy. And in many ways, that's symbolic. So when you're a kid, you get candy and all problems start disappearing. And it works for adults as well. It could be a beer manager, but candy might be more kind of uh, appropriate and the symbolism related to that might be, again, stronger. So. If there's a person who's, again, the candy manager uh, during any kind of uh, team performance events, so when, when you're brainstorming or something like that, if somebody is really upset on a personal level, then that, the candy manager would go and say that, hey, are you okay? Do you want to have a candy? And if that doesn't resolve the situation, then they might go out together and have a chat about that. So, so that that one person's negative atmosphere does not influence the rest of the team. So, so this type of, uh, well, I, I wouldn't call them happiness managers, but maybe candy managers might be suitable for teams as long as their intention is not to keep everyone happy, but to make sure that uh, uh, somebody having a bad day would not uh, affect the team's performance at least too bad. Okay, Marty, thanks. And we have uh, two more people who are waiting to ask you questions. Marina Billiard, so you were the first. Hello, thank you very much for your uh, very uh, good explanation. Uh, but I would like to ask you, uh, what is uh, your advice? Uh, when we start to work in team, uh, how we need to start uh, uh, share no uh, knowledge. Uh, if we need to, to discuss some rules or probably uh, make some uh, frames, what do you think about it? Uh, again, very good question. So, so theoretically explaining this is quite easy, saying that there's a step called sharing knowledge. Uh, in practice, it's, it's very different, at least uh, in the teams that I've been leading. So... Uh, First of all, if you're a manager or facilitator or leader of this type of team, I would kind of uh, plan the journey in such a way that there's, you know, the visible or transparent or official version of the steps that you're taking. And then there's your manager's list. So you have different kind of hidden goals or hidden objectives for each step. And uh, sharing knowledge would be on this kind of hidden list. Uh, and this means that, for example, it would be really dumb, like uh, with the 
with the previous question. So, uh, so how to improve uh, uh, or how to build trust within the team. I would not call a trust building exercise a trust building exercise. I would dis disguise it as something else. So disguise it as a fun activity because again, trust building exercises are dumb. Same goes for knowledge sharing. So instead of uh, making a step in the process plan called sharing knowledge, uh, I would give a task that requires uh, using your knowledge and I would assign it in such a way that while somebody within a, let's say, three-person sub-team is able to really use their expertise, at the same time when they are using their expertise, they need to be explaining everyone else what they know about it and why uh, this type of solution would be suitable. So I split the team into sub-teams so that there's only, uh, let's say, two to four people per per team if if uh, if the larger team is larger than that and within those teams uh, assign smaller tasks that require use of uh, everybody's kind of personal skills and that way they will demonstrate how they are using how how the structural engineer is is uh, making a design for a bridge and how the designer is is uh, uh, laying out the user interface uh, sketch or something like this. And everybody else is watching and they get an understanding of, hey, this person is really good at what they do, which, which means that next time I will not be doing that myself because she's really much better than I am at it. And I'm really happy that she's part of my team because next time I can maybe utilize her. So this is, kind of one one basic level of sharing what you not not really even just knowledge sharing sharing your exp experience and sharing what you're good at does that answer your question okay thank you okay okay thanks and Pasha. uh hello hello everyone hello mati hello and thanks uh, for sharing your experience with us um, My pleasure. Uh, I have a personal question to you. Um, it looks like um, for a good leader, it's not enough to be uh, only qualified to create, um, professionally qualified to create network structure in team. Uh, so how do you think, uh, what do you think personally, uh, what personal qualities uh, should have uh, should a good leader have to create uh, effective network in team? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, well, uh, let, let's put it this way. Again, I don't think there is, uh, I don't think this is linear in, in the way that there is, there's kind of one optimal. So there are different types of leadership. Uh, uh, this, uh, Especially for you, uh, how do you think uh, if you will be uh, a leader of a uh, very diverse team? Well, I like, I like to build balance. So this is, this is dynamic, even in the leadership. So uh, in order for me to be able to be uh, making bad jokes, that means that there needs to be somebody who's balancing that out. If I don't have that person who's balancing out, uh, let's call it a mother person. So mother who says, hey, you cannot say that. If there is a person who I trust that will, will say that, okay, now you're out of line. Okay, that was too much. Then I can make jokes. I will push myself to the limit because I know that I will get support from, from their direction when I'm kind of getting close to crossing the border. Uh, if I don't have that person who is kind of the op opposite of me, uh, that means that I will probably not push myself as far. So again, building that balance. Uh, and that's what I would do. So as, as a good leader, I would figure out, if I don't know it already, uh, whether I'm kind of uh, uh, you know, strict, 
strong leader or if I'm a dialogue based soft leader. And then I would get a get a person who is the opposite of me within the team. And I would hire them as my right hand person. So if I'm a soft leader, I will get somebody who is really <clears throat> shut up. And I will use them if the team needs to be, you know, shaken up and vice versa. If I'm a really authoritarian leader, then I would hire a person who is more conflict resolving so that they can uh, talk to that person if they have issues with me and that way we can resolve and I, and I can be aware of that. So, uh, well, I like ice hockey uh, and uh, sports analogies. So in my experience, again, uh, teams have one uh, head coach, but nowadays uh, almost all of the high performing teams, they actually have two goals that work very closely together and their dynamic is what matters. And, and again, uh, only the players know what the roles are because Officially, you have to have one person who is, you know, the face of the team, who is always answering the uh, TV interviews. But what I'm interested in is looking at the second coach, because uh, the, the uh, tension or the dynamics between these two should be built in such a way that they complement each other. So they are not the same type of persons. If you have two hard leaders, again, they are not adding anything to, to the management. If they are two soft leaders, same thing. So in my case, I mean, I might, I might take a different role. So in some cases, if, if the second person or if I'm the second person, uh, then well, will it be like I mentioned, I will be make, uh, wearing the pinstripe jacket so that there can be somebody else who is wearing a Hawaii shirt and vice versa. Uh, uh, it looks like it's about mental power. Uh, not if you wanna, uh, if you would not, if you don't want to be uh, a historical, uh, like hard leader, you have to be uh, uh, much powerful mentally to share your responsibility and to, to find people which can respond and give feedback to you. Yeah, I think that's, that's also, also true in the sense, and I mean, I like hard leaders and I like soft leaders. Uh, the former CEO of, of uh, Kone, the elevator company, Matti Alahuta, he, he said when he was asked about something related to which is better, hard leadership or soft leadership. He said that, uh, after thinking for a minute, he said that, well, you know, the two far ends of leadership are not strong leadership versus weak leadership or soft leadership. The far end should be good versus bad leadership. And it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you've watched... Uh, this uh, Eurosport fight club night with where's this one jujitsu guy against one Mai Tai uh, person. And it's a battle of which sport is better, karate or, or jujitsu or, or uh, Mai Tai or kickboxing. And again, that's also the same situation. It's not about which sport is better. It's about which guy is best. And again, I would, well, I mean, uh, personally, you might try to try which type of leadership suits you. When I was working in the, in the army, uh, I was a very strong leader. I love yelling at other people. I'm good at it. I have a strong voice and uh, I make a very strict plan for what has to be done. And I make sure that everybody follows those orders to the dot. But after the armed forces, uh, I started doing exactly the opposite. So, well, not at first I started just having 
within the team, I, I, I kind of took a very uh, authoritarian uh, position for myself. But then I had one-on-one -on -one discussion separately with each team member. And that was very informal. And that way, everybody eventually after a few weeks knew that, okay, they can talk to me personally in a kind of soft tone, even though I was keeping up the impression that I was, I was a tough leader. And then eventually I turned into this. So, so I'm a more, I would say dialogue driven, uh, as a leader. And, uh, I try to stay in the background and make sure that, you know, everybody else does the work and I don't have to do anything mostly because I'm lazy. So right now today, I really enjoy when my colleagues or my team is performing well. I don't even have to have the credit for, for myself for some reason. I don't like that as long as I get the paycheck. But I've tried kind of both ways and uh, I know the reasons why the current trend suits me quite well. Thank you. Thanks so a lot. Try, try out and uh, it's fun to do something that you would not naturally do. You might learn something new. Anything else? So guys, anybody else have questions? Do you have questions? No? Everybody is thinking. thinking Everybody about sleeping. Energy. Yeah. No, no, not sleeping, but thinking. I <laughs> It's not so late here. And actually there's a holiday. Okay, so Mati, I know that you have great book, um, Art of Co-Creation. And uh, I've seen that uh, it, it is, uh, it's not allowed uh, to, to, to load just from the site, yeah? Yeah, it's uh, the publisher uh, does not allow for it to be publicly shared, uh, I can share it with my colleagues. So if you're interested in the PDF, let me know. Uh, okay, yeah, I think it's, it's a great idea to have this in the PDF if you, yeah. if you have, because um, you see a lot of questions, a lot of about this uh, psychology of uh, creation and psychology of leadership and so on. So please share this presentation uh, and also share this book it's, if it's possible. Absolutely. And, and yeah, you can, if you want the hardcover version, then you can get it uh, online from Amazon or from mm -hmm. Palgrave. That's the alternative. But let, just let me know. I'll, I'll uh, send a PDF copy. Uh, there was a question that I saw about, yes, please share examples from Andre, uh, if that was about the performance of... Uh, that was something on the end of the uh, <clears throat> of your speech. Uh, I forgot already, but you, you were talking about some, uh, some examples you may share for cooperation for... for, for oh yeah, okay, I think yeah. I remember now. So that was about how a team that is really has achieved a certain level of collective yeah, intelligence, exactly. how right. they can generate something new. So, so uh, uh, I don't know if you guys know Dyson, the vacuum cleaner company. I don't have slides currently for that, but uh, Dyson spent more than 20 years, James Dyson developing the best vacuum cleaner on the planet. So they, they spent insanely long period and an insane amount of money developing a product that was just a vacuum cleaner that everybody has. So it's, it shouldn't be that high tech. But eventually, uh, kind of at the end of this story, when they understood the aerodynamics related to vacuum cleaning and all of that better than anybody else, then all of a sudden they started also uh, creating other products that were utilizing this aerodynamics uh, knowledge. So for example, making those fans, which you've seen that do not have a fan, but it's just a circle like this. Uh, and then the, you know, the air dryers with the orange stripe in the 
in the men's room at least, maybe in the ladies room, I wouldn't know. I'm not allowed to use them. But the hand dryers that has, it's called the, I think the, the blade and same for hair dryer. So uh, everything is based on the best knowledge in the world on, on machines that use uh, uh, aerodynamics. So, well, that's not a well, well, very well uh, illustrated example because I don't have, have uh, slides for that right now. But fundamentally, what the company has been able to do is that once they have reached a certain level after 20 years of uh, doing research and development, they can utilize that knowledge uh, in, in fields that are not related to vacuum cleaners anymore. And again, they can generate profit and, and uh, functionally change the world. And I know that uh, people are paying loads and loads of money for these hair dryers nowadays, which is the latest, I, I think, of the, the line of product because it's so good. And uh, yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> that's, that's one that's example. One, that was a great example. Okay, Martin. So thank you all. Yeah, yeah, and this is the end of our webinar right now, but I hope that we will see you again someday because this is just the start of the project. Uh, yes, and maybe um, the guys have will have some more questions and thanks for you. Uh, and uh, I hope we will see you a bit after. Sure. By the way, you can subscribe our YouTube channel. I did. Oh, you did. Okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but I will not watch this. You video. will not. No, never. You will can watch happen. some other videos uh, if you wish to, because there's a lot of interesting topics during our course. And thank you, Mati, You're very welcome. much for your lecture. It was outstanding. It was quite interesting for us. Happy you stayed awake, at least most of you. Okay, so bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 -bye. bye. bye.